Hi class, welcome to week three. Um, and I hope you're learning a lot in this course. I know um, with classes being online, it's much is left to your reading and discussion boards, and it's been great discussion what I've read so far. Um, I've noticed some people just, you know, having a lot of comments about law, laws and ethics and ethics laws, however you want to say it, protecting the client, but um, much of law and ethics protects the, th the therapist. Um, it helps us set boundaries for us to make sure that we're setting those clear, rigid boundaries. Um, and I, when I say rigid loosely, but having clear boundaries for our clients, and a lot of times clients who come in don't have boundaries and have never experienced boundaries before. And so us demonstrating what healthy boundaries look like and what our relationship is supposed to look like um, really helps model what healthy boundaries um, are. Also, too, um, some of you have talked about previous therapeutic experiences and how um, they haven't always been the best. And if someone maybe didn't have the most ethical therapist, they may have some assumptions about how therapy should be, um, which may not be correct. So you being able to demonstrate, actually, no, this is what the legal and ethical guidelines are, helps clients to better understand maybe what an, a reasonable expectation should be for therapy and maybe help them to understand what their previous previous experience was wasn't what that was so that might have sounded a little vague but there there are a lot of different experiences people can have um, with previous clinicians so it's this uh, this these this week, week three, sorry, I got a little tongue-tied there. We're going to be talking about cultural diversity um, and values with um, this profession. And, you know, there there is going to be a lot of, of things in here that might make you question some things about yourself and, you know, wanting to come into counseling from a Christian perspective. And there's nothing wrong with that. More power to you if that's something you choose to do. However, um, some of our own personal convictions or moral um, personal dilemmas um, need to stay outside of the counseling room because when you're licensed by the state of California, um, none of that matters <laughs> anymore. So your personal biases, maybe your personal stances on specific issues cannot come into therapy, nor can that cause you to not see a client. And I think people have this pre preconceived notion like, well, if I'm a Christian, I don't have to treat this, that, or the other, you know, and that's not true at all. So you must have the ability to work with a wide range of clients with diverse worldviews, okay? Managing personal values so that they do not contaminate the counseling process. So like I said, you cannot allow your own personal feelings about situations, political situations, any of that get in the way of the counseling experience. Um, we cannot discriminate based on something we don't agree with. Um, and let me tell you, um, you already know this because you're living in our world today. <laughs> it is more important than ever that you remain very neutral. This political climate right now is very um, extreme one way or the other. And biased one way or the other and your political views should not be brought up in therapy um clients listen to what you have to say and they're going to assume you as being a source of information and that's not your place and it's not your place to get in political debates with clients so you need to be very conscientious um of what you say and what you don't say to your clients, okay? Um, also, if a client were to like, who did you vote for? I would put that back on them and say, why does who I vote for matter to you? Um, because that really is none of their business and that's not why they're coming to therapy. And when I've been asked certain questions like that, I just push it back on them. Because who I vote for, who I believe in as a future presidential candidate should have no effect on how I treat someone, should have no effect on how I um, diagnose someone, should have no effect on how um, 
I relate to someone or have a therapeutic alliance with someone, it's irrelevant. And people want to make things relevant when really it's not. So just be mindful of that, especially right now. Um, value exploration is at the heart of why many counselor education programs encourage or require personal therapy, just to check yourself where you're at, what's going on with you. Um, again, it, like we talked about last week, that's a way for you to kind of explore yourself, see areas of conflict, areas that are maybe problematic, maybe your own countertransference or things that you need to work through. Um, and you want to be able to manage these things um, because you want to be able to effectively work with your clientele. Um, again, there might be situations where you clearly lack the necessary skills to deal with the issue, but that would probably be a very extreme situation. And just because maybe someone is, let's just say, living with someone else, maybe not married, and that, let's say, goes against your personal values, um, that shouldn't cause you to not be able to treat somebody. Okay, so this is where you people who, I don't mean it as you people, but even for myself as a believer, I'm a Christian, and, and I don't mean to get on my, you know, Christianese hat here, but <laughs> I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, I'm a follower of God. Um, Jesus very clearly met with all different kinds of people. Um, actually, the people he kind of stayed away from were the overly religious, like, annoying people, okay? <laughs> But Jesus met people where they were at. And um, when he met that woman at the well, if you're not familiar with the story, the story is in the New Testament. But when he, when he met the woman at the well, he spoke the truth and love to her. Um, and he very clearly knew why she was there in the middle of the day getting water. Um, he knew her, her man situation. <laughs> but he also offered her and, and made it very clear to her that he knew but he also offered her living water. And it is not my job to judge people. It is not my job as a therapist to judge people. It's my job as a therapist to meet people where they're at. Um, doesn't matter their sexual preference, doesn't matter their life circumstance, doesn't matter their ethnicity, their gender, their personal views on life circumstances, doesn't matter if they've had an abortion or not, doesn't matter if they're a drug addict, doesn't matter. None of those things matter. It's my job to come alongside them, meet them where they're at, and help them along in their journey. Okay? And that is an honor and a privilege and something I feel very um, humbled by. And, um, and, and when you're in that seat and you get to do that, I, I hope that it's a very humbling, honoring position for you. I have come through this field, and, and I feel it. I hope I'm not too much on a rabbit trail here. I have been in this field for a long, a long time, I would say, I guess. I've over 15 years now working on longer, but, um, and I, I've learned, like, by the grace of God, there go I, okay? Um, I could be anyone that comes in my office, but by God's, by God's grace, some of those circumstances have not been my circumstances. So to think I'm better than anybody else is a false assumption. So this is where we really have to check ourselves because we think we're going to avoid certain subject matter just maybe because we have a certain belief system and you won't. It doesn't matter if you work at a Christian counseling center or not. You're going to have all different kinds of cases with all different kinds of situations come across you. So you really have to have your personal values in check. So that is not put on your clients and cause them to really be like, I don't feel comfortable talking to that person because they've put their own personal biases upon me. Okay. I can't stress that enough. Um, you do not want to be discriminatory to your clients. That's going to get you in big trouble. Okay. Um, I want to be, <laughs> again, reiterate this, you know, in some of your posts, we talked about, um, there's consequences for not following legal and ethical guidelines. Let me tell you, when you've done 3,000 hours of time, um, you do not want anything to get in the way of taking away your license. Once you pass that exam, you don't want anything to get in the way of you losing your license. You've worked too hard and spent too much money to get to that point. So you really need to be aware of yourself and how you affect other people. Um, 
because um, you would not want something to get in the way of that, okay? It's, that would be really, really hard to lose your license after you've worked so hard, okay? Um, so again, there's been different kinds of lawsuits over the requirement that students avoid imposing their moral values on clients. Um, there's been multiple court cases in regards to that. Um, so you can do some further um, research on those court cases if you so choose. Okay, I wanted to go to, um, okay, in some states, freedom of conscience, which are clauses that are being inserted in the legislation. However, consciousness objection acts violate the letter and spirit of the ethics codes. So there can be some sort of confusion sometimes with that. And so that's why it's so important to know your state's um, specific legal and ethical um, regulations so that you don't um, do anything that you shouldn't. Um, and that's really important. So spirituality and religion in regards to counseling. So spirituality refers to generally sensitive, moral, ethical, humanitarian, existential issues. Religion refers to the way that a person practices those things, okay? Um, so with that being said, can a counselor understand the religious beliefs of the client? Um, you could to some degree, um, however, everybody practices things sometimes different. So even if someone comes in and says they're a Christian, how they practice Christianity may, may look different. Um, obviously you're going to have clients that come in that say they're Christian and could be a different faith, um, background, um, but say that they are. Um, and so can a counselor work within a framework of a client so say they're a different total religion and you can you work within that framework um, sometimes that can be very tricky obviously if you're not of that religion and you're not familiar with it I would say probably not the best of idea um, now what you might need some further clarification on what they mean by working within that framework um, if that's like having like praying with someone or things of that nature. Now, some of you may feel comfortable praying with the client. Others of you may not. And so you can say like, I don't feel comfortable praying with you because I don't, I don't, it's not something that I practice or I, I do. And so therefore I don't feel comfortable doing that with you. But if you want to pray, you're more than welcome to pray. Um, things of that nature you could do. Um, so sometimes some of that can be part of the issue. Um, and sometimes like religion, obviously not so much religion, but spirituality can be a core, um, belief for a person. And maybe there's some, some feelings, um, of shame or guilt or, um, just uncertainty involving their core beliefs. And so coming into therapy helps them sort them out. Um, and so we don't want to negate that part of a person. I think we were created very holistically and our spirituality is part of that wholeness. And so we want to address the whole person. It's just what our participation in that might look a little different depending on your comfort level and the client's comfort level. Okay. Um, that should be something that you ask at the beginning of therapy. If there's a spirituality or spiritual preference, And then from there, um, be aware of what that means to that person, what it looks like for that person, how that person practices um, their religious beliefs, um, practice their religious beliefs, and then to what the spirituality concept is. You know, um, some people would say they're spiritual, I would say more days, and they will say religious. Um, and so trying to understand for them what that means and not assuming, I think, is important. You'll learn very quickly in this field, it is never safe to assume um, because everyone is so different and um, every person is different and no one likes to be grouped together. And so it's great to ask questions and to understand what that means for them so that you can um, deal with the situation as best as you can, okay? End of life decisions. Um, this is very interesting, right? And a lot of controversy. Um, so there is a lot of different opinions about end of, end of life decisions, um, helping a client, um, trying to figure out what their, um, 
what their thoughts are on the process if it's someone who's in that kind of position um they may want to talk to you about it i know it's just something that was brought to my attention um that kaiser has the ability to um with the with coming alongside a social worker if someone is terminally ill and meets certain criteria they can make a decision to end their life um using specific kinds of medication um and that's a personal choice of a, of a patient and like i said they have to meet certain criteria where they're able to make that kind of decision they're not being coerced by anybody else things of that nature they're in their right mind and so um those might be things that come to you in therapy um it's very controversial everyone has different opinions on it um you know in oregon there was the dignity act became a law in oregon in 1997 um there's actually a documentary granted if you want to be depressed um, it's uh called how to end your life in oregon i believe it's a few years old it's a few years back um but it's very interesting um to see where these people are coming from there's also a documentary that was on netflix called endgame and it's about a palliative care found that also very interesting and so these are things that could come your way um and you know if it's legally assisted that's not necessarily like something where you're having to report um those kinds of things um if they're going through the proper channels now if it's not something that's um being handled in an appropriate way um we have to be mindful of our of our role as being mandated reporters um but if it's something that's going through in in a way that is um done by like let's say a kaiser or you live in a state where it's legal that that might look a little different so that's why it's so important to know what what your responsibility is in those kinds of situations. Um, so there's a rational suicide. When a person has started after going through a decision-making process without coercion from others, that's what I was talking about, coercion, to end his life or her life because of extreme suffering involved with terminal illness. So that's a rational suicide. Um, and so that would be the kind we wouldn't need to report on. Aid in dying is providing a person with the means to die. The person self-administers a death-causing agent with which is a lethal dose of a legal medication okay um hastened death ending of one's life early than would have happened without intervention involves speeding up the dying process which can entail withholding or withdrawing treatment or life support those kinds of decisions are often made in a hospital setting um sometimes patients um stop eating and maybe there's not going to be intervention in that because they're so sickly and ill and they just don't want any sort of um, resuscitation or things of that nature once they enter the hospital and advanced directives and that's like if a person goes in the hospital and goes code blue there isn't going to be any sort of follow-up to um, try to keep them alive um, assuming they have an advanced directive and that's some of the instructions that are in there Oftentimes, hospitals will ask you if you have advanced directives when you go into a hospital. Um, even for childbirth, they'll ask you if you have an advanced directive, um, which can seem kind of odd, but you never know what happens, and that's why they ask those questions. So those are the kinds of things that you um, might that might come across your table, and then that's where we connect values, right? Because you might be very against a patient making that kind of decision, and it might really go against your personal moral code, but every person is entitled to their own feelings and their own opinions. And how you come alongside someone in that journey could be very um, eye-opening for you and a major growing experience as well as be a major support to someone in their last days. So, it, you know, some of these situations you may think, I never thought I would be in this situation or I really don't agree with this situation. And as a clinician, it's not always about what we would do in our own personal lives, but what is going to be best for our clients. And um, you know, people come into our rooms and um, they just need sometimes someone to sit with them in their pain. And it's not about us, it's about them. And that's a very huge deal because there's not a lot of people that have people that will sit with them in their pain. And a therapist is an objective person that is able to do that. And so it's kind of a really awesome opportunity that you have 
even if it's not things, again, we don't want it to be moral and ethical things that we're just sitting there not doing anything with. But sometimes there are things that don't go along with what we would choose. But in those moments, it's not about us. It's about them. Okay, so counselors have an ethical responsibility to provide professional services that demonstrate respect for the cultural worldviews, values, traditions, and culturally diverse clients. Um, so we need to be aware of diversity, cultural values. Um, we need to be aware of some of our clients' cultural backgrounds. Um, and again, this is something that right now in our culture and our society is huge. Um, we're, ta we're talking a lot right now about um, prejudice, racism, systemic racism, um, all these things. And so um, you're, you may get a lot of this that comes up currently just with the agendas that are going on right now. And so we just need to make sure we're aware of what we're saying and how we're sounding and making sure that we're being um, proficient and um, not ignorant in our conversation or our speech. Um, we want to be aware of terminology um, with different ref ethnic groups, um, with um, different types of people. Uh, we want to be able to recognize um, culture with, with a racial or ethnic group and with gender, religion, economic stas status, nationality, physical capacity or disability, um, sexual orientation, ethnicity, a sense of identity that stems from a common ancestry, history, nationality, race, and religion, and race. Um, we want to be able to navigate those things. Um, people who feel like they've been oppressed um, and haven't been um, treated equally. Um, some people tend to relate to multiple groups of people. Um, and so being able to multicultural counseling is the working alliance between counselors and the client that makes a personal dynamic of the counselor and client into a consideration alongside the dynamics of the culture of both of these individuals. So again, I think as a therapist, I don't expect you guys to know every single detail about every single culture out there. Our world is very diverse. There's a lot of different cultures. There's a lot of different things that are going to come your way and you may not know a lot of things about it. I don't blame you for that. I don't expect you to know everything. I think I expect and I think what our our governing boards expect is a competency and being able to ask questions and further understand where a person is at, where they come from, who they are, so that you can best assist them. Um, and, and I don't think it's wrong to ask questions. I think we just have to be conscientious on how we ask the questions. And I think clients love to educate us on who they are and where they come from and what this means and what this terminology means or explain that term to me. I, I don't know what it means. I don't know what you're saying. I don't understand. Um, because I don't think, I think if you go along thinking you understand something and then you really don't, and then they can tell you don't understand something, then that's when you're going to feel really silly and they're going to feel like you're not really listening to them. So it's so important that you make every effort to really try and understand things and admit areas that you don't understand or doesn't make sense to you. Okay. Um, so some different terminology, cultural pluralism, a perspective that recognizes the complexity of cultures and values, the diversity of beliefs and values, and cultural diversity competence, a practitioner's level of awareness, knowledge, and interpersonal skills needed to function effectively in a pluralistic society and to intervene on behalf of clients from diverse backgrounds. This is what I'm talking about, that competency, um, which you're going to have a whole class on cultural culture and diversity and whatnot, but and you're going to learn a lot in that class. However, I think it's important, the competency. I don't think competency means that you know everything, but I think it's that you know enough on how to ask questions and to be aware of a person's differences, backgrounds potentially that's why taking a good history is important um wanting to have empathy um you know trying to figure out um how you can best empathize with the person where they're at and what they're going through um what their world views are um how important something is to them it's important that you're aware of that um there's a lot of um different things that are going on in our world that are very hard 
um, and very, um, personal to very, a lot of people. And I think knowing how to come alongside and empathize with people and support them, you might be the only person in their world that knows how to. And so I think it's great for, for a client to feel like that their therapist can do that. Um, and I think we can encourage people to express their needs and advocate on their behalf to address inequities and injustices they encounter in their community and society. I mean, we could be a huge like part of someone's journey and confronting really difficult things in their workplace, um, with their family, with friends, um, you know, people around them that, that aren't, that maybe aren't fair or aren't right that have happened to them. And we can be huge proponents in, in, in helping encourage them to stand up for themselves. Um, and again, we don't want to get caught up in tunnel vision, right? <laughs> and we want to be globally literate and be aware of things. And so some of that I think is um, us um, just being uh, very aware of the fact that um, there's a lot going on. And the only reason we know there's a lot of going on is we need to be aware of like things that are going on in our world. We need to be in, in tune to things like probably need to know a little bit about the news, whether you agree with the news, you think it's fake news, like whatever. I think you kind of need to be part of today's culture and society in order to help people address some of these things. I'm not saying you have to be immersed in it and have to like be on social media or things 24 seven, but I think you have to be aware of different things that are major things that are going on in this world because they're affecting our clients and they're going to come in talking about it and you don't want to not know, you know what I mean? Um, I would say I'm a person that's pretty aware of pop culture. I, I don't have cable television or anything of that nature. Um, but I think I'm a person that's pretty aware of it. Um, because of just, I like to learn and I like to, um, like read news articles and I like to watch documentaries and, you know, things that are kind of popular sometimes just to see like what my clients are talking about. Like this might sound terrible, but, um, there was a, a TV show that I had a lot of clients talking about that was on Netflix. And so I decided to watch it just because like the client kept referring to it. Um, I think it was the, the TV show you, some of you might be aware of that show. Some of you may not. Um, and you might think it's terrible that I watched it. I have whatever judgments you want. Um, I'm not saying CBU recommends it. I'm just telling you my personal experience. Um, but I watched it not because like I had some burning desire to watch it, but my client kept referring herself to being in some sort of situation similar to that show. So it was kind of interesting watching it. And I'm thinking of my client while I'm watching it. And I'm like, really? I, I don't think it was this extreme, but whatever, for whatever reason, she really saw herself in that show. So, you know, I think being aware of what's going on in our world and knowing what people are talking about is kind of a big deal for our field because people are going to come in talking about it, right? If we stayed, like if every therapist stayed exactly like Freud, I don't know if therapy would be as effective as it is now. Ther therapy is ever evolving, ever changing. That's why we always say with law, law and ethics, we have to be aware of the changes that are going on because our world is constantly changing. As soon as coronavirus hit, how everyone does therapy has changed. Um, with virtual sessions, HIPAA laws, all these things have changed like overnight. And so we as clinicians have to be very aware of these things and, um, and, and make sure we're staying on top of it. We can't have stereotypes in our office. We have to be very careful on how we speak and assume. Um, now that might be a way your client talks. Okay. But that doesn't mean that needs to be a way you refer to people or you talk and you have to like know your audience. You have to um, be very conscientious of, um, you know, maybe that would be something you would say to a friend, but that's not something you would say to a client. Not to mention that doesn't mean you should be saying it to a friend, a stereotype, right? And so we just have to be aware because like we, we don't want to be part of the problem that then causes the client to not, um, to not come to therapy and or sue you, right? <laughs> um, we're talking a lot about racism right now, right? Um, any pattern of behavior that solely because of race or culture denies access to opportunities or privileges um, to members of one racial or cultural group while perpetuating access to opportunities and privileges to members of another racial or cultural group. 
So we want to make sure that we aren't obviously racist. Um, but this might be something that our clients are experiencing. This might be something that, um, that they're talking about, especially right now.